Some say history is a river that flows endlessly. I say that history is a series of stories written by each person's experiences. Welcome to Stories, a history of Appalachia, one story at a time. Hello, folks, and welcome into the podcast. I'm Steve Gilley, along with Rod Mullins. And, um, you know, folks, as we look for stories to put on our podcast each week, one of the sources that we have are local newspapers throughout the Appalachian area. And as we dig through these stories, you know, for every, what, Rod, 10 to 15 stories, we might find one that we can expand into a podcast, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I'd say that's probably a, a good guess there of how many we are able to put together into one. So That leaves us with a ton of nuggets of really good stories, short stories, if you will. And we'd kind of like to share some of those with you today as a full podcast by reading some of these um, newspaper articles. And I'd like to read them because I love the language in these turn-of-the-century newspapers. And the thing is, we've got to really say this, too. These are from my hometown. These are from my home county of Dickinson County, Virginia. Ah. So these are going to be very interesting, too. (laughs) And I'm like you. I love the way that some of these are worded and the way that they're told. It almost reminds me of Walter Winchell, almost like 50 or 75 years even further back without radio back then. But it's all in print. And it will give you a taste of life in the Appalachian Mountains. So without further ado, let's get started with our first little short story uh, entitled Homicide in Dickinson, Dwale, Virginia, August 11th. And, and folks, this is all around 1891, 1892, okay? Robert Stanley, a farmer, was killed by his brother-in-law, Caleb Lane, at the latter's home on Lickfork Creek the other day. The particulars of the affair, as gleaned by your correspondent, are about as follows. The men were living within a short distance of each other, and one of Lane's hogs went to the Stanley premises and was bitten by his dog, at which Lane became angered, and taking his gun, watched about Lane's house to get sight of the dog, intending to shoot him. Stanley was gone from home at the time, but when he came back, his wife informed him what Lane, her brother, had been doing. He then got his gun and had his wife go with him, taking the dog along to Lane's house. When they reached the premises, Stanley called to Lane, telling him to come out and shoot the dog if he wished to. Lane came out with his gun, but made no attempt to shoot the dog. The men then quarreled. Lane attempted to shoot Stanley, but his gun did not fire. Stanley then shot at Lane, missing him, which actually turned out to be a mistake, because then Lane shot Stanley, filling his head and face almost literally full of shot, from the effects of which he died in a few hours. Wow. (laughs) Now, we've got to say this, too. After that, information that was received later on from the neighborhood was to the effect that Lane later surrendered himself to the authorities, too. Is that right, Steve? That, That is absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. There's another story that I particularly like, and I'd like you to tell about this one. It's a couple of lines down from that one it's a called a singular mountain feud oh yes a singular mountain feud well this is very interesting because a family in cumberland mountains are at loggerheads dwell dickinson county virginia march 9th a singular family feud had just terminated in cumberland mountain happily without bloodshed This section is rather isolated, the mountain forming the boundary line between the states of Virginia and Kentucky. The people here off in a nook where they are not affected by the march of civilization. They remain in something of a primitive state while other sections are keeping pace the progress of the age. They are to be met in these mountains as unique characters as were ever delineated by the versatile pens of Dickens or our own Washington Irving. Old Cornelius Vanover, who is remembered as the oldest settler of the mountain, was always distant and much reserved in his manners, and went but little into social circles. He reared a large family. Most of his children partook in strange peculiarities, for which the family has long been noted. The boys all married, but only one of the girls embarked on the matrimonial sea. The others, either from choice or necessity, remained under the paternal roof. They range in ages from 25 to 55 or thereabouts. 
David, the eldest son of the old man, has always lived within one half mile of his father since his marriage. He reared two sons who have been addicted to bad habits from their boyhood up. From some cause or other, they grew up a hardness to express it in mountain vernacular between David's family and that of the old man, which was soon kindled into a flame. Dave and his boys armed themselves and swore vengeance against the others. The old man and his family were always afraid of Dave and his force and usually kept under cover while the latter were about. But for this course, doubtless, there would have been bloodshed. On several occasions, clubs and rocks were brought into play, but nothing more serious than bruises had resulted from such affairs. This state of things continued for a year or perhaps longer. Dave and his force always on the aggressive side, while the others were on the defensive. Wow. Now, that kind of makes you wonder what was going on there with that whole story. But, you know, this was the whole thing. They just realized they couldn't live within the bounds of the same neighborhood with one another. That's right. That's just unreal. But, I mean, you know, this was a family. And I got to say this, too, Steve. Uh, part of my family history goes back onto the Vanover side. So this is pretty interesting reading something about this. And some of my relatives over from the Cumberland Mountains going over toward uh, what they call Osborne Gap, over toward Pine Mountain. This is pretty interesting. So you could be kin to Cornelius or Dave, couldn't you? Well, uh, could be, and I, I'd rather not say right now at this point, but at <laughs> least I know that they at least partook in, in clubs and different things like that, and they didn't shoot and commit bloodshed. Okay. Well, let's move away from all the violence for just a moment. And, and this next story we shared on our Facebook page and got quite a few likes on this one, but I want to share it with you podcast listeners as well. It's titled Far Southwest, Very Much Married. Dickinson County, Virginia, November 18th. Your correspondent learns that George Isaacs, age 71 years, who, it is charged, has seven wives living in Kentucky, Virginia, West Virginia, and Ohio, eloped from Beaver, Floyd County, Kentucky, Tuesday with a pretty widow. Soon after arriving at that place, it is said, he learned that officials were looking after him, and he skipped, taking the woman with him. He married Mrs. Liza Polly, a widow of Sargent, Letcher County, and after living with her three months, he deserted her, going to Beaver, where he made his seventh matrimonial venture. Isaacs is hale and hearty and can walk 40 and 50 miles a day over rough mountain roads. Now, Rob, which are you more impressed with? The fact that he was 71 and could get seven pretty widows to marry him or the fact that he's 71 and he can walk 40 or 50 miles a day in the mountains. I'm just going to put it to you this way. I'm impressed with a number of things. One, he's 71. Mm -hmm. Two, that he's been married seven times. Three, that he can walk 40 or 50 miles over a day over rough mountain roads because he obviously has a libido that's been able to keep him going for those 71 years. <laughs> because, I mean, honestly, who could walk 40 or 50 miles a day over rough mountain roads, and especially at the age of 71? Dang, he must have been really in good shape. One way or the other, from marrying seven wives or walking those 40 or 50 miles. A man with an excess of energy. That's what I say. Uh, he may have been the poster <laughs> boy for Viagra back in those days. <laughs> now, another little headline is called Revival of Religion. It says here that there seems to be a general revival of religion in this section. 28 were baptized at Sand Lick. Dickinson County on Sunday accession are being made to the church almost daily in all directions. So it appears that in the 1890s, there, there was a bit of a religious uptick in the area. No, there was. And I mean, you, you got to take into consideration too, especially I can remember people talking in Dickinson County and, and several of the, in several of the communities when you had churches in the outlying areas, not particularly in the, the town itself, but in the outlying areas, church only met maybe once a month yeah that's all they they met but i mean maybe if you were in town you probably met every sunday or maybe every other sunday but if they were out in the country somewhere if you had a small little church out there they pretty much only met once a month so guess what 
you better be getting religion and you better hold on to it for about three or four weeks before the next time church rolled around. And there was a lot of uh, big things going on of revival back in those days. And I, I know that it had to be a big thing back in those days because, you know, these mass baptisms were not unheard of at those times. That's true. Okay, Dickinson County, Virginia, December 29th. Your correspondent learns that there was a cutting affray near Stratton. I think we can figure what a cutting affray was. Uh, I think so. On Monday, between Floyd Smith and Floyd Sutherland, in which the latter received 21 gashes, while the former only received one or two slight cuts. Full particulars of the affair have not been received here yet. A well, cutting affray. Yes, indeed. Sounds like a knife battle to me is what it sounds like there. So, <laughs> Well, that's what we call it now, a cutting. That's what we'd say. Yeah, it's a cutting. So. But, you know, that's not the only one either. I think there was another altercation that kind of happened back in July 12th in Clintwood, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, tell us about it. Jack Howell and Wiley Davis, they engaged in an altercation on Sunday of all the days in which the latter was seriously, if not fatally, stabbed. It's not known whether you know he had lived or died, but the men had been on bad terms for some years past, and Mr. Davis had started the church and met Howell near the house on the ladder. And when a quarrel arose between the two over Davis's cattle having trespassed on Howell's premises, after some hot words, Hal drew his knife and advanced toward Davis in a threatening manner. Davis then seized a rock, which he threw at Hal, but missed his aim. And when the latter rushed upon him, inflicting a dangerous wound in the region of his abdomen, Hal then, doubtless thinking he had killed the man, ran and left him. Davis remounted his mule and rode home as he was not more than a mile distant. No one saw the difficulty. This is Mr. Davis's statement, but no one knows who knows him, I should say, uh, can question the truthfulness of it. Howe was promptly arrested by the officers and will be dealt with as he deserves. He is said to be very disagreeable among his neighbors, and one of his brothers is now in jail in Prestonsburg, Kentucky, awaiting trial for a horrible murder of which he is accused. Mm, wow. Well, speaking of violence and speaking of religious revival, let's combine the two. It's entitled, A Serious Row Between Factions at a Church. Your mm. correspondent learns that religious services were broken up yesterday, Sunday, near Sargent, a point a few miles from here on the Kentucky side. James Bates and Tilden Wright on one side, Wilburn and Daniel Bentley brothers on the other, became involved in a quarrel, and a general riot followed. All these good churchgoers pulled out their pistols, knives, rocks, and clubs, they were brought into play, and bloodshed was narrowly averted. Further trouble is feared, as the men swear they will not surrender themselves to the authorities. There is bad blood on both sides. Wow. Now, who goes fighting in a church? Well, back then, I'm sure a lot of people did. It just depended on what was going to happen back in those days, about what was said, how things went. Oh, that's scary, though. Clintwood, Virginia, October 21st. Last night, there were about 16 gallons of brandy stolen from Owens Distillery about two miles below town. The, well, I guess overjoyful were left at the distillery in a barrel, and there was no enclosure around it. There was nothing to prevent it from, yeah, you guessed it, from being stolen. Stolen brandy. Cutting a phrase. Uh, feuds. Murders. Hmm, sounds like nowadays, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> well, Rod, there's some other stories in here, too. Not quite as bad as that. Won't you share some of those with us? Well, we've got one more that I'll pretty much share with you here, and this has to do with probably the, the name will probably sound familiar to a lot of people when I bring the name up, and it has to do with, um, oh, how can we say this? Let me find it here and, and tell you about the the man by the name of uh, Silas Hall. I think he has something to do with the name, and it has to do with the, uh, the uh, well, has something to do with the Mullins family. And remember the Killing Rock? Yes, yes. Well, Silas Hall, Clintwood, Virginia, March 2nd. A young man in the vicinity of Ava in this county was accidentally shot on Monday last. Young Hall and a companion were out together, and the former while showing him 
his pistol accidentally discharged it, the ball taking effect in his body. The wound is a serious one, and Hall's recovery is a matter of doubt. Deputy Sheriff Hall of this place and a posse of armed men made a raid on the two Fleming boys, Cal and Heenan. Hmm, those names sound familiar. Now, it will be remembered that they are indicted together with Doc Taylor for the murder of the mm-hmm. Mullins family last spring in Wise County. They were staying at the house of their brother some three miles from this place, and Sheriff Hall learning of their whereabouts, summoned his guard and went there. But someone had informed the Flemings of the intended raid, and they had secreted themselves in the brush. And upon the approach of the officer and his men, they opened fire on them, but without effect. The fire was heavily returned by the officer's party, but it is not known with what effect. You know, you you read these in history books, these stories, and then you see them in the newspaper, and it just gives it a whole other dimension, you know? Mm-hmm. It just tells you it was a it was a very rough and tumble time back in those days because I've heard a lot of stories about it, and I've just heard so many different stories about the the rough and tumble times of you know going in busting up stills, all these different things about the way that things were back in those days. It was rough, and I'm telling you, this is just amazing just to read some of these old stories and how they were written back in the newspapers, especially almost over 100 years ago. Oh, yeah, and we're going to close this podcast out with just a real quick little story to show you that uh, times don't change, and if you are a doctor or a lawyer, you get some free publicity every now and then. This little blip just says, Attorney R.E. Chase has just added a Remington typewriter costing $125 to his already equipped office. Now, I have no idea what $125 in 1891 is worth now, but it would have to be the price of a really fancy computer system, centralized computer system. So this is where Attorney Chase, I guess, is bragging about that new technology he's got so his secretaries don't have to handwrite every little pleading that he's got. And you know who you're talking about there when you say R.E. Chase? Tell me about it. I believe you're talking about Roland Chase, who later became Senator Roland Chase, and the building is very predominant there on Main Street in Clintwood, beside of the courthouse. It was later known as Miller Funeral Home, which uh, it was... Later on, one of his uh, ancestors, later on, R.C. Miller had Miller Funeral Home. It is now the home to the Ralph Stanley Museum there Ah. in downtown Clintwood. Oh, wow. See, you know a lot of that local history, and it's good we can pass that on to folks. He also had to do with uh, putting together him and Galley Friend put together a baseball club in Clintwood, too. Oh, yes. In fact, I saw that. That's another one of these stories that's farther on down the line. But we're going to save that one for another time. Because we've got so many of these, you know, we're just going to keep rolling on and on and on, and folks will get bored hearing our voices. So we'll just take the rest of these stories and do them on a later podcast. How about that? That sounds good to me. All right. Well, these are all stories, all of them, that make up the history of this place that we call Appalachia. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to the podcast at iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or on your favorite podcast app. You can follow us on Twitter at Story Appalachia, or you can like us on Facebook at Stories of Appalachia. We'd love it if you did. So until next time, take care. We'll see you then. So long, everybody. 